a banner year for Montclair State School of Communication and Media. And this is only the beginning, now on Carpe Diem. Hello and welcome to Carpe Diem. I'm Mark Efron, a professor of journalism, TV and digital media here at Montclair State University. This week we turn the cameras onto ourselves. It's been just over a year since the School of Communication and Media moved into our spanking new headquarters. You can see a little bit of it. We have state-of-the-art equipment, state-of-the-art teaching tools, state-of-the-art students. Anyway, the new building coincided with a new director for the school, Dr. Keith Strudler. He came here from Marist College. Keith has turbocharged our already full program of majors, activities, and events. Welcome to Carpe Diem, Dr. Keith Strudler. Thank you very much. You know, I've only been on that side of the, uh, of the table so far on Carpe Diem, so it's a, it's a little uh, daunting to be here in the, in the questionnaire. I don't, being, being kind of questioned. So well, so. get used to it because yeah. I do not give up the seat. <laughs> so, so it's been a really busy year. I mean, we, we moved into the new building. You started a little more than a year, almost right. not quite a year and a half ago. What do you look back on? What, what's changed uh, with the, this phenomenal new facility, but also where the school is and where it's going? So I think, look, Anytime you move into a new facility and as a program's growing at the rate that our school is growing, I mean, we're looking at somewhere between 10 and 15 percent enrollment growth per year, something I think we can project out for several years, particularly as we add new majors and new areas of study. Um, so there, there's going to be kind of the, the obvious kind of challenges of, of getting into that, into that new space and that new orientation. So I think what we did really well last year was we found a way to hit the ground running, as opposed to kind of spending time and saying, let's figure out how to, how to move into a building and let's see how this all works and get oriented with our offices. I think we took that opportunity to really turbocharge and provide opportunities for students that just didn't exist before. So give us a couple of examples. Yeah. Um, I know we've had a number of really great guest speakers. Talk about some of those. Sure, and I think one of the, one of the goals, I think, for me, certainly person, personally, is to enhance kind of the, I don't know, the external brand of, of Montclair State School of Communication and Media. I think for a long time, people internally realize what kind of great stuff happens here, and the students that come through here realize it as well. I don't know that that's necessarily projected to the external public, so one of the ways of doing that is making sure that, that those publics, particularly people of high regard, prestige, and you know, kind of know the business really well, kind of do the car wash through here. So we've had a lot of them certainly interact with our students. Um, we've had uh, Willie Geist, Jeremy Schapp, um, just to name a couple, boy, uh, uh, boy, you can, you, 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 you her, her, uh, uh, well, there have been a whole lot of yeah. them. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a, uh, a, um, a colloquium series that really yeah. brings kind of a who's who. I mean, John Frankel came through yeah. the building. Uh, Adam Zucker, your cousin, came here through Colonel the building. Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel Jack Jacobs, who's now a member of the school's communication and media board. Um, so we've had a lot of people. We've also had um, companies come in for official recruiting visits. We've had Disney come through and do a full day on campus for recruiting. We had MLB Networks, we had Fox, and we just recently had NBC Universal come through here to spend an, a full day on campus recruiting students. So what do you hear from the speakers, from organizations like NBC Universal, ABC? What's their feedback about our students, about the facilities? In other words, you talked about, in some ways, when you got here, one of the things you wanted to address was the idea that maybe we're a, a, a best kept secret. Mm -hmm. And the more people, both in New Jersey and the tri-state area and beyond, the more they see what happens here, the more it becomes a viable option. What kind of feedback are you getting on the school from these outsiders who come in? So I typically hear a few things. One is, this place is great, right? This building is fantastic. It often is accompanied by, if you, particularly if you're a uh, person of my age, um, I wish we had that when I was in school. And that, that tends to be a universal. Um, they also typically say, your students are great. You know, they're really interested. They ask great questions. They're involved, which is exactly what you'd want out of your student population, is that they're inquisitive and aren't afraid to ask. And third, and this is the thing I think we, we knew, was I had no idea. 
And so that typically is number three. And so, you know, it's, we, we do the thing we, we, you would do with, with anyone who comes into a new restaurant, like, oh, don't forget to tell your friends. Yeah. Right? Kind of the, we have an amuse bouche? <laughs> however you say that. An amuse bouche, that. bouche yeah. Amuse but bouche. Uh, it's kind of like <clears throat> one, of, one of my favorite episodes on Cheers where, you know, so there was a horrible incident and, and Woody kind of yells at them as they walk out there, don't forget to tell your friends about Cheers. <laughs> but, but I think don't forget to tell your friends about Montclair State University. And I think we are not only bringing people into our campus, but we're trying to get them to also bring their friends and to, you know, encourage them to have other speakers and to be increasingly involved with what we do. Okay, so let's move beyond speakers. Let's talk about some of the other initiatives. Um, let's talk about PR. Sure. Uh, how does that fit into the School of Communication and Media? I mean, I think people hear, they hear communication, they hear media, they think news, they think comm studies. Talk to us about PR, is that important? Oh, it's, it's, it's vital and I think by most regard as the fastest growing sector in the communication industry. And it's one that I think, look, I can take a step back and I hate to get too inside baseball for our, for our viewers, but as long as we're being self-reverential, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll indulge myself. But, you know, I think the school has all of these incredible assets that were brought together through really a, a 10 year process of inquiry and, and, you know, working in academia, it's not always easy to make things work. Um, it's a, you know, it can be a, a challenging logistical environment. And so people here worked really hard to bring together these incredibly strong assets from around campus, communication studies and uh, our broadcast operations and TV and journalism and film and all of these different areas came together. PR was one of those areas, but I think it was historically somewhat underserved. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it grew out of a communication studies or org comm orientation. And so that was kind of its legacy here. And I think certainly, I think a lot of people that knew Montclair State from a, a communication media perspective, knew Dumont and knew TV and knew kind of their history and work in that area and maybe the film program as well. So I think PR was never necessarily allowed that moment in the spotlight. Um, not because there weren't people that were really interested in or, or working on it, but just it, it wasn't necessarily given its moment. And so I think it's a disservice to our students and to the, you know, the students from New Jersey and the region that want to come and study and pursue th that career opportunity because I think increasingly students who graduate will see that's where their strongest job opportunities exist. And it's not simply in kind of traditional PR roles, whether that's kind of the PR person reporting to the C-suite or even in the agency environment, but rather kind of that, that entire landscape of strategic communication, which kind of butts up in advertising and marketing as well, that becomes very much kind of the, uh, the storytelling arm of every kind of organization. Right, so, so, so tell us about what the school so is So how have we done, how yeah. have we addressed that? So I think we've done a few things. I mean, certainly we've, we've added faculty. We've just brought in a, a brand new faculty member who has strong professional government work in PR. We've actually added a, an adjunct instructor who was a, a, a partner at Taylor PR who has, and this is kind of, uh, I'll get to the bearing the lead here, but we launched a, uh, a student-run PR agency called Hawk Communication. And they are essentially the professional arm of, of the PR program and they take on real world clients mm -hmm. and they are doing everything from press releases to social media what to strategic clients? comm. Give us an example. Uh, a good example is they're working with the Montclair Art Museum and Great. doing uh, some, some strong work with them which actually is a wonderful symbiotic relationship because we're doing some other, other work with the Art Museum as well. And so, so they, I mean they have a suite of internal and external clients with the philosophy being we want to do less but do more for them. So we're not going to be uh, an agency that takes on 20, 20 clients. We're going to be an agency that takes on three or four clients and gives them really strong opportunities. And I think we've also kind of jump-started our PRSSA program, which has been around now for 10 years. What's here. PRSSA? Uh, it's the, essentially, it's the, uh, the Public Relations Student Society of America, right? And it's, it's kind of a, under the umbrella of PRSS, PRSA, which is the kind of professional organization. Um, and they are... Um, they are kind of the, the, you know, the body that kind of brings together all practitioners from universities across the country for best practices, um, you know, training and, and you name it. And so, and also we, public relations in 2018 and 2019 is very heavily social media. Oh, We're not talking about cranking out on the Mimeo machine, the old press release. No, We're and, talking and about I, a, a very cutting edge apologies, profession. Apologies to the listeners for mentioning a device that they have no idea what that is. Yeah, well. <laughs> so we're not doing things in triplicate or anymore. They, or they do. Know. But they do. Yeah. So You don't know. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, so I mean, PR today is, it's a world of largely of social and analytics. I mean, those are the two things and content creation. Right. The very different world. But so, um, so our, we, our PRSSA program is, is 
kind of re reinvigorated. We're bringing in top name speakers. We actually had the uh, the president of L'Oreal Paris, you know, of the U.S. Um, come here and speak about their communication strategies. And of course, we got along really well because we both, you know, very handsome and, and you know care about how we look. Yeah, so, right. um, but uh, I got we we are doing more with influencers. We're actually bringing right. in someone from I believe from Ketchum who's going to be working yeah. on influencers. And we are increasingly allowing or kind of encouraging our PRSSA leaders to become involved on the national level. We actually had three students there with their PRSSA national convention in down in Austin, yeah. um, my favorite town in America. Um, and they were kind of trading best practices yeah. with other schools across the country and are gonna bring some of those, those, uh, those practices to our campus. And then I will add one other thing is we are really looking at how we can start to bring in some of the technologies that will um, that will give our students some of the skill sets that they need to thrive in entry-level job positions. And I'll, if you give me one second, I'll kind of walk you through that. I think one of the challenges we've had, because our PR program wasn't necessarily given, put on the front burner, kind of like our TV program is where we have these amazing studios and equipment and, and so forth, that in some cases we've had students that have gone through our PR program who maybe didn't enter the workplace with kind of the cutting edge skills that they needed. And they were at, you know, even though they were certainly qualified and smart and eager, they just didn't have the training they needed to compete with students that came from other top programs. And so we're really trying to figure out, we're actually looking at building essentially a, a center for strategic comm where we'll have kind of the, the full range of, of software packages, um, social media listening, data analytics, um, production equipment, all the things that students will need to learn in a co-curricular environment um, that they can essentially become you know, top of the class. And so they'll enter the workplace with the skill sets that they need to thrive. So let's let's move on because we have we're like I could talk skipping PR all stones. Day. I'm sorry. So you know one of the things uh, that I hear when when I give tours of the building, um, and they see these amazing facilities, the studio we're in now, they go into the news lab, and I have parents say, okay, where if these if our kids come here and they put on shows, where do they appear? Now obviously Carpe Diem is on cable throughout this entire region. So that's been established and has been going on for many, many years. In terms of newscasts, there hadn't been one. So one of the other things that started just this year was a Montclair News Lab. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that and why in an age of digital, in an age of Snapchat and everything else, why you thought it was important to, to put together a, a weekly newscast. Well, I think, look, there, I think in many ways, when you're looking at kind of the media environment today, it's not an either or, but it's an and. Um, and so I think we are increasingly training students that have to be able to produce content across a variety of different platforms and in a variety of different formats for a variety of different publics. And I think there's incredible value teaching students how to produce a, I don't wanna say a standard newscast, mm -hmm. but a newscast that takes on many of the elements of what we kind of grew up on. But I would say, and I would say, Mark, you would know this better than I because you are the person fronting that operation. I am? You are, oh. so interesting that question. I was trying to ask an objective interesting, question. Interesting, that question <laughs> made it up to the top of the riser. No, but, I was going on your <laughs> so, list. <laughs> yeah. so, um, but I think they need, look, for students to be able to, and this is why you study history, and I, I don't wanna equate your newscast to a historical artifact, but you also need to understand kind of how, you need to understand how a, a, a proper 22 minute newscast can be put together with a modern flair and twist. And I would, right. I would suggest what you're doing looks very little like the newscast that we would have seen 10 years ago, yeah. but it is much more modern. It's something that can be chunked into, uh, into elements that can be used on social. So I mean, you're making the kind of newscast that you would see at a, at a network environment today, but it then becomes repurposed across a bunch of different platforms. Right, and, and, and in regard to that, so for example, the PRSSA students are working to use social media to push out pieces of the newscast. And I think the, uh, just the other thing, since we're talking about it, is the, the skill sets of learning how to write and learning how to collaborate and learning how to, how to shoot and edit they're not going away. You know, the, the, it may be Snapchat this year, maybe something else right. next year, but th those basic core right. skills are always going to be important. For right. And you, you try not to teach, you try not to teach to a, to a tool. You try to teach kind of the, the, the skill sets. Right. Because the tools do change. And right. for, our, for everyone, you know, 
unless everyone's still walking around with their Blackberries, you will find that, that these tools are going to evolve and they will evolve far more quickly now than we could have imagined. Yeah. So, um, so I think we do have to, to teach the kinds of skill sets that allow for our students to be marketable and employable. And so, um, you know, so what you're teaching is how do you do research? How do you produce, you know, watchable and entertaining content? Um, you know, that's, that's the same thing that you're going to need whether you're doing it for TV or whether you're doing it for Snap right. or whether you're doing it for Facebook. So your, your background um, uh, is in uh, sports communications, sports media. You set up this uh, extraordinary program at Marist College. Um, and I see there's a lot of activity going around here now in terms of um, really kind of putting resources and focus on sports, both in, internally and also with some outside partners. And that, I think, is one of the more exciting things that, that's going on here. Now, tell us about that. So I, so I will say- I'm really <laughs> asking tough questions, aren't I? <laughs> Throw me a tough one. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, ask me, you know, ask me what I had for dinner last yeah. night. The, well, that's so, a tough one. <laughs> that yeah. is. Um, so the- uh, It was probably tofu. I wish it were tofu. No, it was actually it was actually pizza because, as you know, yeah. I had to do some some parenting duty, which which kept me out late and uh, okay. you know, Hebrew school and all yeah, that stuff. Right. So, uh, so when I first started in academia, which was you know back when we were writing on stone tablets, yeah. not not digital ones, um, we. I recognize that there was a huge void in the academic marketplace for people who wanted to work in sports media and sports communication, which is why I started this program back in, at, at Marist, really in, in 2000. Mm -hmm. There is still a large void in that, in that academic space because sports media has grown exponentially since that, that time. And, and even with some of the kind of kinks in the armor, when you look at an ESPN that's having some challenges, the, the amount of content distribution and creation um, and information around sport and sports media is just kind of a, a constant feed the beast. And it's a global industry. I mean, so particularly, I mean, I have two kids that are bigger fans of, of European soccer than they are of most American sports. Mm. And so it is a massive global industry. And we are perfectly positioned to train and become a leader, both in kind of, you know, uh, the students that we'll have coming through here, but also in kind of the partnerships and relationships that we can cultivate externally. So, so tell us about that. Let's, so, yeah. So I'll tell you, so I'll, I'll get into that. And, and just realize, I will skip over all the exciting part of this conversation, which is if you're an academic leader, which, you know, which I am, um, you really have to spend a lot of time looking at curriculum and making sure you're teaching students the right things. And so, you know, for all the kind of, look, I understand that a big job being like a, a school director is, is uh, privileging and prioritizing the sizzle, but there's a lot of stake behind this. And so we spent a lot of time looking at what's the best kind of curriculum we can provide. And, and Kelly uh, and I have, have spent a lot Kelly of time. Whiteside, Kelly Whiteside, well known who's, sports journalist. Sports journalist. USA Today, New York she still Times. Writes the New York and she's Times. leading our I sports. I should say she's still right. She writes for the New yes, York Times. Yes, and she, is, uh, she leads our sports media right. and sports com program. But we spent a lot of time saying, what should a modern sports communication program that isn't just TV or journalism or just PR, but is the range of skill sets that allow our students to work to anything from a team to an agency to a network to a university. And so that will be coming out within the, probably the next year. And so we're going to have really, I think, one of the best academic programs in the country. That's but, exciting. Oh, it's very exciting. And that's really, I mean, you know, for everything, you know, what my real background is, I'm an academic. And yeah. so um, I enjoy digging into curricula and I enjoy making sure that students are getting the best academic experiences they can. And so I think that's important. you mentioned outside partnerships. Let's, yep. let's talk about some of those. How does that work? Because, you know, one of the things also I hear from both students um, uh, and, and from parents is, okay, looks like a great school, great faculty. We love Montclair State, beautiful campus. What's going to happen after four years? you know, are, are my kids going to be any closer to getting jobs? And I read all this crazy stuff. So tell us what kind of connections in terms of sports right. uh, and, and how the university and the School of Communication and Media sees its role in trying to expose our students to real world, uh, you know, kind of post cable um, sports environment. Right. So I think one of the, the most exciting partnerships that we really have kind of taken some baby steps in and then last Last summer, we took a big leap into the pool, and hopefully we're, we're going to be swimming a little bit more over the next upcoming years. But 11 Sports, which is one of the, these emerging kind of, I don't want to say post-cable, because that's still where they're making most of their money, is kind of in a, in a cable environment. But they are one of the networks that doesn't necessarily aspire to be everything to everybody, but is a, uh, 
I think they like to refer to themselves as stickier kind of operation. Also, where, it's niche sports, so right? It tends to be a little bit more niche. Um, sports media. Niche or niche? Which is it? Well, root, route, potato, okay, potato, yeah, your choice. Yeah. So Let's call the whole <laughs> thing off. Yeah. So you know I'm sleep deprived. I'll get I'll get I'll get punch drunk really yeah. quickly. So um, so I would they yeah, right they they may be doing drone racing or they may be doing kind of small market college football or they may be doing sports that simply a darts which is huge overseas yeah. not so big here. So you'll see them do a lot more niche kind of programming. And they del and they deliver it a lot of places on on, on YouTube. They have four or a five lot of over the they top have four networks. Four or five different platforms yeah. that, that they can reach the public. One of them is cable, but mobile devices, Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. I mean there really are many different ways. I think you could probably get on your toaster oven if you really yeah. try. The, so they are one of really a handful of these kinds of networks that is kind of operating on the edges, particularly as our companies like ESPN find that you can no longer operate as this monolithic um, kind of sports operation often because you, you leverage too much of your company buying rights, you know, buying the rights for billions, for on billions of dollars yeah. on, on, on often your, you, it's very risky, it's kind of like being in the home building business, it's very risky when you start buying too much land yeah. because if there's a change in the marketplace, you're exposed. And you're stuck with And you're stuck with, yeah. where you're stuck with commodities you have to sell off. Yeah. That's what's happened to ESPN. So we're seeing something like Eleven pick up those pieces. Now, when you're a nimble, small organization like that, you don't have the overhead, but you also don't necessarily have the capacity that a place like ESPN. So you might look to a place like Montclair State, people that have fantastic facilities, kind of an innovative ethos, and really strong students and graduates that want to work. So what happened? So, so, so they called us. So we had already worked with them a little bit, actually, before that. Um, we had, and these are some, some old friends of mine because they were old ESPNers, so people mm. I'd worked with in the past. And they, you know, they said essentially, look, we have the broadcast rights, the English language broadcast rights, to the World Softball Championships that will be coming from Chiba, Japan, and a bunch of other sites in Japan. And we essentially have the rights to broadcast this over a bunch of different platforms, and oddly enough, a bunch of different networks, which is how con convoluted the world of kind of modern sports media works. And even though Eleven might own the rights to it, they may not necessarily even be broadcasting it. But we need a way to figure out how to get a raw feed from Japan through probably the US, if possible, to a bunch of countries and network partners, they're going to broadcast it. After, after the English play-by-play after, play after is, is, is added, is is added, added here. So, so, of course, with you know with four days' notice, we said, of course you we can do that. Yeah, of we course can do we that. did, because we, we're, we're both crazy. Because uh, 72 games, 12 nights, 9 p.m. to 9 a.m., what could go wrong? What could go what wrong? What could go wrong? So, because there are a lot of... Uh, a lot of crazy people here like like the two of us and a lot of people with the right spirit and a lot of students that are always looking for resume work and portfolio work and to make some money. Um, we were able to essentially become the English language broadcast home for 11 sports where feeds in three separate broadcast rooms and we turn conference rooms into broadcast rooms and that's one of the other things that you find in kind of the modern media environment which I really want Montclair State to be a leader on which is we need both the big production space like we're sitting in now but there's this whole other production world which is small, right? Uh, and so right. you can take, we're in it right now, and I'll, I'll finish the story with what we did. We essentially hired about 15 broadcasters to call 72 games, and we set up screens where they were seeing the raw feed, which came over And many of these were our students or former the students. The vast majority were right. our students or former students who called probably three quarters of the games right. that, that came through on a raw feed, they watched it on a monitor, they did research beforehand, they did the English language broadcast, it was re-encoded through devices and went out to I think 30 countries across the world. And so that's an answer to uh, parents who ask, you know, what's what's the world? Uh, these kids got paid. These kids got so, paid and they are, they have resumes and they also, and they're, they're gonna get hired someday. So in the couple of minutes we have left, what are the things uh, on your horizon that you're most excited about? I know we have a big event coming up with the art museum. Yeah. I know there's a bunch of other things, but yeah. so what do you see as? So we're as really we're really talking about a couple of minutes here. Yeah, the, the time goes quickly. Can yeah. we do another? Hour? I'll come yeah. back next week. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so uh, oh, I think they already booked <laughs> next week. That's fine. It's <laughs> fine, Patty. I'll I'll be here. Don't worry about it. Uh, so um, so look, there look, there are a lot of the the inside baseball stuff that's going to happen. We're going to continue to to modernize our curriculum and make sure our students are getting the best kind of educational experience as possible. We're going to continue to bring in the top recruiters. There are a few really exciting things. One that's going to start this spring, we're going to be creating a, uh, 
a Montclair State in Los Angeles program where starting the spring, a group of 20 students will go and spend a week in LA mm. uh, in a four credit course, doing studio tours, looking at internships. We hope to expand that to hopefully perhaps even a semester long program. Can, can I sign up for you that? Are, you have just aged out of it, it's interesting, okay. yeah. You're like six months out. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's pretty exciting. We have a, a huge event coming up on November 12th. You know, one of the goals for for the school is to be more engaged in our community um, for a long list of reasons. And so we're doing that by partnering with the Montclair Art Museum, another very wonderful organization in our town. Um, and we're gonna be holding an event on the 12th that will bring uh, three really dynamic speakers to a panel. That's uh, Joy Reid, Soledad O'Brien, and Kai Wright. Um, and they'll be talking about the intersection of social justice, race, media, and art here on the 12th. That is open to the community. It is going to be a packed house. We plan to do a whole lot more things like that. We're working with our board member, Jack Jacobs, on a, a leadership institute so we can kind of uh, provide training on leadership communication. So I'm quite excited about that as well. Um, obviously, we're looking at more and more external partnerships. We're looking at, you know, as this news lab uh, that you produce ends up on Channel 34 in town, we're actually in discussion to see if we can have a, a larger stake in the ground in Channel 34 so we can kind of do nonstop production. We have a bunch of new degree programs coming through, including a master's degree in media production that we're working on very hard right now. And so I think that's gonna provide a lot of opportunities for students that are a few years out that want to kind of get both management skills in media and also kind of high level uh, kind of production skills. So um, last question, quick answer. You're, you're talking to parents now who are watching this. Why should their, their students, their children look at a school of communication and media in general and Montclair State? A 10 second answer. Oh, great. Um, communication and media is more than ever one of the most vital uh, industries and sectors of humanity, probably more than anything before. If you've watched anything over the last two years, you should understand how powerful communication and media is. And why here? Look, the school is amazing. It is, we are poised for continued success. We have great faculty. We have the best facilities in the country and we're 12 miles from Manhattan. And if you look out our back window you can at see night, it. it's it, it looks like a movie. We're gonna it's have a gorgeous. zip line. You're gonna be able to take it right in. Uh, you know what? With <laughs> NJ Transit, I think that's a great idea. And on that note, Keith, thank you very much. Thank you. If you would like more information about the School of Communication and Media or any edition of Carpe Diem, if you want to see what uh, Dr. Strudler ate for dinner over the last week, write to us at the email address on your screen, Carpe Diem at Montclair.edu, or call us. 973-655-5158. Keith will pick up the phone. For Carpe Diem, I'm Mark Efron. Thanks for watching.